The following program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Time of Grace. It all starts now. Welcome to Time of Grace. I'm Pastor Jared Oldenburg, and we're finishing up our series this week as we talk about how can I make a difference in someone's life. I think all of us know a person who Malcolm Gladwell, in his book Tipping Point, call a connector. There's someone who knows everybody. This week, we look in God's Word as Pastor Jeske says, how can we make a difference? And he uses the examples of two different people that know all kinds of people, and they use that gift of God to make a difference in people's lives. The hatred that a captive, subjugated, occupied people have for their occupiers is not just from the 1940s. That same resentment was very much alive and well at Jesus' time as well. Jesus lived in an age when the Jewish people no longer had their independence. They hated it, just as the French hated being occupied by the Nazis in the 1940s and they restlessly looked for any way they could to push back. But then, as in the 40s, there were some people who said, you know, there's some business to be transacted here. There's, there's some angles I see. I don't see the Romans leaving anytime soon. Why should I grind out my life in suffering? There's some money to be made, and one of the ways you could make money was by buying a tax franchise. And it became a horrible way to use graft and cheating and corruption and gouging. And these tax collectors, the old word for that is publicans, were loathed and hated. In fact, they were today what we would call uh, drug dealers and pimps, you know, the lowest of the low. The people that you don't want in your family, you don't want your daughters dating, uh, you don't want uh, any of your sons hanging out with any women like that, that are lowlifes like that. You want to stay away from them. You don't want them in your house. You don't want them living in your block. You don't want them doing their sick business on your streets. They are like down here. And it's like, stay away. Well, in Jesus' time, the tax collectors and the prostitutes was, in, as you read in the page of Scripture, was kind of a, a byword. It kind of was the standard metaphor for people you don't want to be with. You don't want to touch them. You don't want to go anywhere near their houses. And least of all, would you want to eat their icky food? You'd want to stay away. Everything they touch is full of slime. And they became lepers, but you know, um, there's, there's money in prostitution. If there wasn't, people wouldn't keep doing it. And there's money in tax gouging. So these guys said, well, I don't have any friends but at least I have money. In other words, the money makes it all good. I'll, co- I'll comfort myself at night as a social outcast as I review my investments and I count my gold coins. Surprise. Jesus is not only kind to low lowlifes like this, but he goes after one in particular and recruits him into his traveling seminary to become a church leader. Who thinks I'm making this up? Good. Glad you didn't raise your hand then either. In fact, pretty much a safe thing. Don't ever raise your hand <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm asking you stuff because that way I'll never know for sure what you're thinking. You can always pretend like I knew all that stuff. I'd like to invite you to open your Bible with me to Mark chapter 2. Early in Jesus' ministry, he's finished his early phase down in Judea in the Southland. Now he's up in the north in Galilee, and he's up at his new sort of headquarters town. Nazareth, his hometown, was very hostile to him. They basically ran him out of town, and he said, I'm done with you all. I'm going to go where people are going to listen. So he hardly ever went back to his home village again. And Capernaum, at the very northernmost uh, shore of the Sea of Galilee, became his go-to place. He had friends there. He could stay there. Some of his disciples were from there. 
And in fact, they got so much of his teaching and saw so many of his miracles that Jesus actually threatened them and warned them one day, you have seen more than any other town or city or village in the history of the world. In fact, if Sodom and Gomorrah, two cities destroyed by God with raining, burning sulfur from heaven, if they had seen what you have seen, if they had heard what you had heard, they would long ago have repented of their sins in dust and ashes. So your fate in eternity is going to be worse than theirs because of the hardness and stubbornness of your hearts. I was right in your midst, but you, most of you, were not paying attention. But boy, some of them were. Jesus was teaching in a house. The chapter begins with the incredible story of a paralyzed man who was carried on a gurney. The best they could do for a gurney was basically a blanket or a mat maybe woven out of straw or rushes, and they carried him by the corners and tied some ropes. They couldn't get close to Jesus, so they actually climbed up on the flat roof, took the tiles off, is this insane or what, and dug a hole in the guy's roof. Somebody they probably didn't even know wrecked his roof so they could lower their friend down and give him a shot to become ambulatory again after a lifetime of crippling paralysis. Is that amazing or what? And Jesus didn't say beat it. In fact, he uttered incredible words. He said, hey there, son. Uh, you know what? You have the forgiveness of all your sins. And, and the guy didn't argue with him and say, I don't need forgiveness. I want, some leg, I want my legs back. But instead, the guy gratefully believed Jesus. And I think Jesus then heaved a sigh of relief because then the conditions were right for him to speak words of new strength. And those crooked, uh, atrophied muscles and ankles, all twisted up ankles, got straightened out and the guy walked out of there. In fact, I got a hunch as soon as he got clear of the crowd, he didn't just walk. You know what you would do if you had been given the gift of mobility? You'd have tried out your new legs, wouldn't you? Yes, you would have. You would first have walked, then you'd have jumped around for a while, and when you were tired of jumping, you would have broken into a trot to see if you could do it, and then you would have turned on the juice to see how fast these, these new gams would work for you. Word of that spread. Jesus now is walking on the main road going into town, which was like the big commercial strip. It was like a strip mall. Because the weather is so much more gentle there than here, they did so much more of their business outdoors because you could do it year-round. And who should Jesus spy in verse 13? But is this large crowd, as he's walking along, revealing the word to people, he sees Levi, son of Alphaeus. Uh, that also happens to be the name of the father of James the Less. Uh, you're never going to get any agreement whether that makes Levi and James the Less brothers or whether it, there were two different guys named Alphaeus. It's a pointless argument. No one will ever know, so I'll just leave it alone. But anyway, this man Levi had been named by his mother after the sacred patriarch Levi who had been given the extraordinary honor of having his descendants not get territory. They got territory at the tabernacle and the temple. The Levites were God's chosen agents to see to the worship life of the Israelite people. They were the altar guild. They were the service guild. It was like a man's service guild. They were the carriers and porters for the tabernacle when it was on the move. They would be the ones to care for and set up and clean the holy vessels that were used in the worship life. They were the livestock handlers to bring the sacrifices in and set them up. And one small subset of their number were the priests who were the ones chosen to offer up uh, prayers on behalf of the people and offer up the sacrifices. And all of them, priests and Levites together, were the teachers. They were the carriers and communicators of the Word of God for 1,500 years. And yet, one of them becomes a collaborator. And like Pierre Laval, Levi said, hmm, did a little calculation. The Romans are here to stay. They're not going anywhere. Why should I scuff through my life scratching out a living? If I suck it up and go and buy one of those franchises, I'll be rich over time. 
And he did what Laval did. He said, this is never going to change. I'm with the occupying force. So he basically gave away his social honor and respect for the money. And he may, at least at one time, have thought that that was a good deal, that he was going to come out ahead. But he had somehow heard about Jesus, and his words had struck at his heart. Jesus sees him at his tax collector's booth and goes right up to him at a place no other Jew wanted to get anywhere near. People would run from Levi. Jesus went right to him. And he said, you're going to hell. I, I made that up. I lied. That's what you'd have expected him to, to say, to threaten him with damnation for the evil things he was doing. Instead, Jesus said, how'd you like to join my traveling seminary and study with me? And Levi said, you must be crazy. Do you have any idea what I net out of this business? No, I made that up too. He followed Jesus. That's a two jaw-dropping things. It's amazing that Jesus here is demonstrating what the gospel is all about, giving worth to the worthless, giving love to the unlovely, giving grace to the graceless, giving mercy to the, the, the unworthy. That's what the gospel does. It, Jesus did not come to earth to pin medals on the high performers. He came to rescue fools and sinners like you and me and Levi. And Jesus saw with sadness that he was getting a better reception from this underclass and this outcast part of Jewish society. And the church people, headed up by the Pharisees, were so full of themselves they had no room for him. Isn't that insane? You, the church people should have been the most ready and alert and tracking the signs to be ready for their Messiah when he came. In fact, they were the farthest behind. And the most losers of society were the ones who know they needed a savior. The prophet Isaiah long ago had said that every mountain has got to be leveled and all the ditches have got to be filled in. What that means is pride is like a gigantic obstacle obstructing your view of Jesus. And if you're full of pride, if you don't think you need any help, if you like your life just fine, just the way it is right now, if you think well, I got a few problems here and there, but I'll fix them. If you are full of yourself and your own capacity, the message that you have a Savior, you just think, well, I, don't, I don't need any Savior. It like, doesn't, doesn't interest me. I'm busy. Get out of my way. On the other hand, if you are so low that you realize, I got nothing here, you might be open to somebody saying, I have mercy for you. Now, that pit cannot be so deep. Uh, you can carry that to a fault, you know. The, the ditches that Isaiah said have to be filled in for Christ mean that you cannot beat on yourself so severely that you say, I'm hopeless. That's a, see, that's a, the reverse scam of the devil. One scam of Satan is to say to you, is to whisper to you, you're, off, you're awfully good. It's those other people who are the, the problems in society. You're fine. You're, you're one of the good ones. Just as bad is his whispering, you're so far gone, there's no hope for you. You might as well just live like a pig because that's all that's left to you. That's bad too. But Jesus found a hearing among these lowlifes and he said, uh, Levi later wrote about this, you know him uh, not so much as Levi, you know him by his other name, Matthew. He was honored. We don't hear Matthew's voice in, in all of the Gospels. He never speaks up. But he did write up. He wrote the first biography of Jesus. And Matthew quotes Jesus as telling the Pharisees once, the, the church people, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. John came to show you the way of righteousness and you didn't believe him, but the tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. So Jesus says, follow me. And Levi got up and followed him. All I... I, my jaw would hit the ground if it was not moving so much right now. Wow! Wow, wow, wow. 
The only possible explanation is that he realized, I've been a fool. What have I got for all my money? Do I have peace in my heart? No. I'm an outcast in society. Everybody hates me. I'll be dead soon. I'm, I know I've been chiseling and cheating like Zacchaeus, his tax-collecting buddy down in Jerusalem. What have I got to show for my life? I'm terrified to die. I'm not happy. My money has not bought me one bit of peace. I have no satisfaction. I know I'm selling my people out. I know that I'm a traitor. One of these days, somebody's going to put a knife in me. Had to be afraid where he walked. People probably would spit on him when they could. That's no life for me. He found his God to worship, who was a better God than the money idol he had been worshiping. Then, and here's sort of what, what I think is the coolest part of this, he brings his fellow tax-collecting weasels over to his house to meet Jesus. Levi is a connector. Doesn't have many connections, but he's got his peeps. And he said, come here, I gotta, I, you need to meet somebody. Many tax collectors and sinners. So there's other low, what other kinds of low lives would there be? Gee, I don't hate to even speculate. Uh, I'll let your imagination go wild. Who are these sinners, in air quotes here, eating with him and his disciples? There were many who followed him. And by the way, his disciples, Jesus is messing with them too. I mean, they were brought up by the Pharisees. They thought of themselves as being, you know, kind of, kind of leaders, kind of good guys. Their mothers had told them to stay away from prostitutes and tax collectors. Don't touch them. Don't go in their houses and don't eat their slimy food. Stay away. And now the dis- Jesus says, come on, we're going over to Levi's house. And they're all going, what? Ugh, really? Really, Jesus? So they had to get over themselves and realized that the gospel is a message for the dying and the wounded and the failures and sinners. It is not a medal pinned on the chests of the perfect. Jesus was acting out for them the mission to which he had commissioned them. And incidentally, pay attention, folks here in this congregation and anybody else who may happen to be listening in at this moment. Pay attention. Jesus is telling you how to act. As you have had mercy shown to you, you in turn live out the implications of that by the way in which you show mercy to other people. Don't ever look down at somebody else as morally worse than you because your sins make you just as bad a slime ball as any of those people you're busy sneering at. The disciples needed to learn this Not just by teaching, but sitting there and participating in it. And they had to pick up Levi's food. And they had to put Levi's slimy tax collector food in their mouths. They had to show him respect and hang out with his loser sinner friends. And Jesus was modeling the gospel. The church church boys gave everybody a hard time. The Pharisees saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors and they started ripping on his disciples. Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? You can almost hear the the gob of saliva hitting the sidewalk when they said sinners. On hearing this, Jesus said, his his, uh, spidey sense picked up that he was being talked about. So he can hear this. So uh, he offers a little observation to his Pharisees, whom, by the way, he spent time with too. He was interested in them as well and spent time with them and gave them chances to receive that mercy too. Jesus said to them, Oh, oh, oh boys, is it is not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick. I have not come to call the self-righteous but sinners. Really, everybody's a sinner. But if you're so full of yourself that you think you're fine and you're ready to go into Judgment Day and stand on your own record, you are a big idiot. Because every act of defiance, disobedience, and ignorance that you have against the will of God 
makes you just as guilty as anybody else. In fact, one of your sins, one of your worst sins might be blindness, the sin of spiritual blindness to see how little of your heart God really owns. So the only proper conclusion to this story is for all of us to repent. Jesus said, you should be like the tax collectors and prostitutes. They owned up to their sins. They know they're evil. They know they need help. And that actually makes them get ahead of you if you're smirking about all your good deeds. So in humbleness, we'll get down just like them and we'll sit with Levi and his lowlifes. With his today, we would say the, the drug dealers and the pimps. And we will sit with them in a common humility and admit our need for a Savior. What I really love about what Levi did was he not only embraced and received God's mercy, but he immediately thought, I have people I know who need to hear this. Man, life is short. Not a one of us knows where the clock is ticking. Every one of you has digital numbers above your head blinking down your time on this earth, and only God can see that clock. But for all you know, you're in your last hour. You don't know. You can't tell how many ticks are left on your clock. Nor can you tell how many ticks are left on the clock of the people in your life. Here's my encouragement to you to make a difference with your life by seeing yourself as a connector. Every one of you has an amazing network of relationships. Work, people you know from work, people you're related to, people you live near, people you have common interest with, people who hang out at some of the places where you hang out. I bet the, the, the quietest among you knows at least 50 people with whom you have some degree of influence. And the noisier ones among you probably have a thousand and, and everything in between. Make a difference as a connector before your time is up and their time is up. Look what Levi did. He brought his peeps to sit here and listen to the Messiah and give him a touch. He didn't know enough to be a great evangelist at that moment, but he used what he had. He brought the man himself. You have never had more advantages for sharing the gospel of Christ than you do right now. Yes, you, 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 and you with the technology that is available to you for sharing the word today. You not only have a mouth that works and a brain and a heart, and verbally and orally you can tell people about Jesus, but you now have the technology of print, the technology, I heard there's this really cool television program that you can invite people to watch and learn about the gospel of Jesus. If you're not sure about that, I'll, I'll explain it after the service. Come see me with a cup of coffee and I'll tell you about it. The digital resources available to you make everyone around the world with a computer available to you. And social media and all of the way in which you can influence people's lives are all available to you to use to be a connector like Levi and help people have a shot. You can't believe for them. You can't compel them. But you can give them a chance and you can let the power of the word go to work on their hearts. So this, this then is my encouragement to you. This is the final Bible study in my series to appreciate and aspire to be a teacher, to appreciate and aspire to be a world missionary, to appreciate and aspire to be a leader in the work of, of ministry. And my final encouragement to you is to aspire to and yourself become a connector and let God's mercy and love and the precious gospel flow to you and through you. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jeske. We have a letter from one of our viewers. They asked this question. 
It seems in our society, embracing all faiths is the thing to do. In other words, whatever you believe is okay as long as it doesn't interfere with my beliefs. I think what you noticed is very true. Long are gone are the days when you can just knock on someone's door and have a disagreement about what they believe. Instead, it seems to be a slower process. Now, I'm not saying you have to respect, especially as a Christian, and believe all faiths are valid. However, you do have to respect and love each person. So people are embracing faiths. We're asking to come into their lives and embrace them. And what can we do? You can listen. You can hear. You can respect who they are and look for opportunities. Because when people see that you love them as a person, when people see that you respect what they believe, when they see that you respect them, they're way more willing to listen to what you have to say. And the thing that we have to say is the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Pastor Jeske. Come pray with me. Heavenly Father, what a great privilege it is to know many people. That's a blessing that you give to each of us. And some of us just know more people than others. And we don't always look at that like a gift that you have given us. But we pray that we can use that gift, the people that we know, to be an influence into their life, connecting other people with the right people. And even if we don't have the courage at that moment to share our faith, use our abilities and our courage and our connectedness to put them in the same room and put them in the same conversation with people who can share their faith and explain it in a way that transforms hearts because we know only your Holy Spirit can do that work. We ask this in your ever-powerful name. Amen. For Time of Grace, I'm Pastor Jared Oldenburg. It's been a great privilege to be your host here this entire month. Would you like to see some contributions from me and other pastors on a daily basis? Tune into yourtimeofgrace.org. Remember, it all starts now. It all starts now. Mm. It all starts now. The time of grace. It all starts now. The preceding program was brought to you by the friends and partners of Time of Grace.